So we left off. Um, we left off with the carpet baggers and the scalawags, and now we're moving to uh, a terrorist hate group that was established during Reconstruction. In 1866, we see the rise of the uh, Ku Klux Klan. The, the first Klan um, is established during Reconstruction, and they just launch really a reign of terror throughout the South. Um, against free African American men and women. The goal is to prevent African Americans from gaining jobs, uh, getting registered to vote, getting to the ballot box. Um, it got really uh, so bad that the government is going to intervene. Uh, the first leader or grand wizard of the original Ku Klux Klan was a Confederate general by the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, again, this particular group spreads beyond Tennessee and in throughout the former Confederacy into the South. And uh, eventually, uh, President Ulysses S. Grant and Congress will pass a, a law um, that is going to be known as the Third Force Bill or the Anti Ku Klux Klan Act. And it's going to basically established martial law and military action against the Klan. We also, you know, need to understand that the country's under military occupation this time in the American South, so it kind of worked out, and this does successfully crush the first Klan. We are going to see a rise in the second Ku Klux Klan at the turn of the century, early uh, 1900s, there are a couple of motivators um, that come out of this. A film, the first full-length feature film, uh, known as the uh, is it's known as Birth, Birth of a Nation, that we'll talk a bit about later. Not to be confused with the most recent Birth of a Nation that came out that was about Nat Turner's Rebellion, done by Nate Parker. This one was done by D. W. Griffin, and uh, this um, particular film kind of glorified the idea of the lost cause, glorified the, the, um, the sort of uh, platform and ideology of the Klan. And the Klan will be reborn um, in Georgia in, in Stone Mount, on Stone Mountain, uh, in Stone Mountain, Georgia, not far from Atlanta in the early 1900s by a guy named William J. Simmons. We'll talk a bit about that later, what happens with that. Clan, and then tragically, yet again, in the post-World War II era, we see another rebirth of the Klan, and we're still dealing with that today, tragically. Um, so they were known as the Invisible Empire, and on the right, that's a really famous artist that I pointed out last class. His name is Thomas Nast. He was a political cartoonist. He did a lot of work. Um, yeah, very good. Nice job, Nate. Yeah, the re the... I'll talk about that a bit later, but um, eh, you know what? Explain it now. Thomas Mass, um, like obviously St. Nicholas and the idea of Santa Claus, like that's nothing new. That's as old as the as the Saint as St. Nicholas and good that dates far beyond the Civil War. But the American uh, idea and the American vision of Santa Claus came from Thomas Nast. Um, and we'll take a look at that later on. He's also the guy that busts up the uh, Boss Tweed ring in New York City. Um, but he does a lot of work with Harper's Weekly. Um, if you're ever interested, I've got this. This is a, a book of Harper's Weekly articles, but it's also artwork and um, political cartoons compiled during the entire Civil War and Reconstruction era. It's kind of cool. Feel free to borrow it anytime you like. So, nice little resource for it. So this is a NAS cartoon with the Klan and with the White League in the American South, former Confederates to terrorize African American families and to um, use these really violent tactics like lynchings. When we think about lynching, we think about someone being hanged. But the reality of the lynching is this is being executed without a trial. What's up?
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another important aspect of the Reconstruction era is really the, the birth of American imperialism. This is an era where we start to expand. And this occurs with America's purchase of Alaska for $7.2 million. They called it Seward's Icebox or Seward's Folly. They thought it was a ridiculous that the Secretary of State, uh, William Seward, was trying to buy Alaska from Russia. But in the end, it's as good a deal as Louisiana, right? A lot of resources, a lot of timber, a lot of gold, a lot of oil, and uh, fishing rights, shipping rights. Um, so important that there will be a campaign for for control of Alaska in World War II. So this is the beginning of American imperialism, and that's going to be a lesson we're going to get into next semester, uh, and, I'll, and I'll touch back on uh, Seward's icebox. So here we have uh, William Seward. I, I love these political cartoons of Seward and President Andrew Johnson. And I got you a picture just to show you. That's really what Seward looked like. Uh, in those, in those uh, images. He was Secretary of State under Lincoln and Johnson. So we talked a bit about compromise last, last uh, class. We talked about how the moderate Republicans and the radical Republicans kind of had to come together on what they were going to do for nominating the next Republican president. It certainly wasn't going to be Andrew Johnson. So they settled on Ulysses S. Grant. Grant's kind of one of those guys that didn't really have to seek out the office. The office sort of sought him out because he was a war hero. He had been a success. He was a respected general. Um, so he's going to run in two terms. In his first term, he defeats Horatio Seymour. And in his second election, he'll defeat Horace Greeley. His two terms are actually, there's some successes that come out of them. Um, he wants to move toward reconciliation with former Confederates. He wants to provide for sweeping rights and opportunities for freedmen. He wants to reconciliate with Great Britain, which will lead to the signing of the Treaty of Washington. He establishes Yellowstone National Park, which selfishly I'm very appreciative of. It's one of the greatest places in the country. I want all of you guys to visit at some point in your life. It'll change your life. Uh, they had a really bad fire. They, they, they do. Like a, there's like a, something. They have geysers in there. Um, they have they had a really bad fire not long ago. Um, it's it was devastating. But their natural fire is constant. Um, and then uh, and then he obviously passed the legislation to use military force to stop the Klan. However, the man's entire two terms are just marred with scandal um, and we it's kind of probably hard for us to wrap our heads around the fact that some of these scandals are still rank up there as some of the worst scandals uh, politically in American history um, and that is uh, number one would be Black Friday this is where um, a couple of uh, tycoons a guy by the name of Jim Fisk and a guy by the name of Jay Gould tried to corner the American gold market with inside trading on Wall Street and inside tips um, in the federal government. Luckily, Grant kind of stepped up and, and stopped the bleeding, but it was a, it, it ultimately leads to a catastrophic um, financial panic uh, in 1873. We have the whiskey ring. Um, there was an excise tax passed on alcohol after the war, and a lot of those tax collectors were Grant's cronies. A lot of Republicans, a lot of former Union generals, colonels, captains, on and on and on. I mean, think of all the people that served in the military. Well, they get a lot of jobs through the spoil system or the crony politics that Grant lived with. And again, like this isn't just a Grant thing. We talked about this with Andrew Jackson. It's very difficult to find any American president that didn't put their own people in charge. But it just spiraled out of control because America comes out of the American Civil War really a, a global power, right? And an international trade 
power. And that war catapults us into the second industrial revolution. So these guys were stealing tax revenue, and it was like people in his cabinet were involved, his brother-in-law was involved. There's just a lot of really close people connected to it. And then the most scandalous of all would be Credit Mobilier, which in our world probably doesn't seem that scandalous, but in the post-Civil War era, it was really just, it, it was a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And, and this was going on throughout the Civil War. But what Credit Mobilier was, they were like a shovel company, and they got a contract to build, to, to produ produce products for the Union during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, but they elevated the cost of the job, like they inflated it by like two thirds more than what it was worth. So like millions of dollars of tax dollars that are being stolen by the company, but that company is employed by government agents and former you know, union engineers and union army personnel and people that are on the inside and the government are getting kickbacks who know about it. That was a problem during the war and it, it was a problem after the war and it really just makes grants. Um, it, it, it really mars and like sort of stains his public service um, toward the end of his life. So a guy who was like the victor of, you know, Vicksburg, the victor of mathematics is seen as like, you know, an inept president that's trying to hang on to a three-ring circus. So this is Grant on the left as president, our 18th president, and on the right, this is a satirical magazine that we're going to visit next semester. It's called Puck. We're actually going to visit a number of these magazines. We're going to look at Puck, Wasp, Judge. They provide some of the most incredible political cartoons, and we're going to break down a lot of those political cartoons moving into the Gilded Age next semester. So what's Lee doing after the war? Well, uh, he does not run for any political office. He uh, ends up taking a job as president of Washington College in Lexington, Virginia. Um, after his death, they will rename the college Washington and Lee University. He will emphasize the importance of Southerners to reconciliate, but to also receive an education. This is Washington and Lee University. Has anybody ever visited this location in Lexington, Virginia? Um, so this is the main campus. This is Lee Chapel. Um, Lee's buried in the bottom of this chapel in a mausoleum with his family. Right across the way is his office that he worked at. And then right outside here is Lee's warhorse traveler is buried there. If you walk on up the sidewalk, uh, about 100 yards to 150 yards, you get to my alma mater, uh, Virginia Military Institute. Both colleges are side by side. And if you walk down this way, you uh, walk right into Lexington. It's right downtown. Um, there's also a statue just out of sight here. It's actually a statue of Cyrus McCormick, inventor of the Mechanical Reaper. What's Frederick Douglass doing after the war? Well, Frederick Douglass is fighting for the rights of African Americans, passage of the 14th Amendment to guarantee um, individual rights, passage of the Civil Rights Act, the passage of the 15th Amendment to give African American men the right to vote. He's also a crusader for civil service reform. Because prior to this, and even during the Reconstruction era, there was a big problem where, and this still goes on today, how many people have ever been in a scenario where you either get a job or you know someone that's got a job, not because of what they know, but because of who they know? I think we can all kind of that, right? right? So that's what we call patronage. We call it nepotism. Well, this is a period of time and like, we could, we could really, we could argue about whether that's good, bad, or ugly today. But this was really ugly then because if you allowed patronage to continue, African Americans would never get jobs, right? Poor whites were never going to get jobs. So the, the premise of this is that Frederick Douglass is stepping up and saying, look, you've got to provide a merit-based system to employ people. You can't just let it be about 
who you know rather than what you know. And this really, it's a bigger crusade. It's the expansion of historically black colleges. It's an expansion on vocational education. This is really where uh, Booker T. Washington comes uh, out to shine as saying, look, you know, we've got to, pr we've got to provide for vocational education. We've got to provide for opportunity. We'll talk more about Booker T. next semester and W.B. Du Bois. Um, another important thing here is that Frederick Douglass is the first African-American to gain um, a position as ambassador. And he will become ambassador to Haiti after the Civil War. Um, and this is fitting because Haiti was a country of former slaves that rose up against the French and gained their independence. And here we have a couple of images in a map related to Frederick Douglass's time in Haiti as ambassador. The election of 1876 brought about an end to Reconstruction. It is uh, sort of like another corrupt sort of election. One of the closest in American history, Rutherford B. Hayes, who they nicknamed Rutherford B. Hayes from Ohio, who's a Civil War general, and Samuel Tilden from New York, who had been the lawyer that brought down the Boss Tweed Ring, who we'll talk more about later. These two guys square off in a bit of a mudslinging campaign. And what ultimately happens is that it's so close to call, it should have been decided by Congress. But they decided, due to the issue of Reconstruction, to work out sort of a backroom deal where hand-picked um, congressmen and a hand group of hand-picked judges would determine who the next president was. Well, they end up going with Hayes, and I'll answer your question in a second, because this gave the Republicans control of the White House. They obviously had control of Congress. And in turn, the South would regain control of their local and state governments. So what this becomes known as is the Compromise of 1877. This is one of the most contra controversial compromises and controversial moments in American history. Because this is where the South not only regains control of their governments, but they return to the status quo, which we call this group the Redeemers. They create what is known as the Solid South, and they start passing sweeping local and state level what type laws? Racist. Jim Crow. Racist, yes. Jim Crow, yes. But furthermore, they take it a step, they take it a step further, and that is passing literacy tests, where you have to be able to do more than just write your name or sign an X to vote. You have to rewrite the Constitution or rewrite the Declaration of Independence, or you have to pay a poll tax, or they move your registration station, or they move your voting station. There are all these ways in which African Americans, but also poor whites, and soon Latinos and other immigrant groups coming into the country, they are going to fall victim to these laws as well. Question? Yeah, um, so when, when Lincoln uh, initiated the slaves, did he mean to give them rent or did he just throw the most respected of white people? Hands down, yeah. Um, in fact, Doris Kearns Goodwin, her book, Link, uh, Team Arrivals on Lincoln, and the film Lincoln, done by Spielberg with Daniel Day Lewis. Like, that film is really, it's hard to believe that film is based on just one chapter of her book. But as soon as the war is coming to an end, he is fighting tooth and nail to get the 13th Amendment passed. And it is really an amazing feat to get everybody on board because not everyone in Congress was like, huzzah, give rights to all African Americans. A lot of people were using a term that we're going to talk about later. It's called gradual emancipation. Like, oh, we were time, you know. Yeah. And then what we see is that Jim Crow does, in fact, keep African Americans from having equal rights for like another hundred years. So, yeah, so Jim Crow, so if, if Jim Crow weren't there or wasn't there, then would uh, 
slaves, or I guess like the Africans have gotten their um, civil rights earlier. This is what's really tragic about this era. The, the reality is the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was ignored after, after, the, after Reconstruction. And all the rights that were held for a decade were ripped away, like not overnight, but like within a three year period. This is, a, this is what I would say is one of the most telling and even chilling statistics. Over that decade long period of reconstruction, um, over 300 African Americans had been elected to local, state, and federal office. All right. By by 1880, just three years after Reconstruction ended, that number was down to three. So that's how quickly it. That's how quickly the rights were taken away. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's crazy because the law, like this, this is like the real crux of sort of the irony of, of this, like major level of irony is that the Civil War was largely fought on that principle of the 10th Amendment, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you can't deny that states' rights played a role in the Civil War, and much of those states' rights had a great deal to do with the institution of slavery. But then when the war is over, and this compromise comes through, and the Redeemers retake control, and they start passing these Jim Crow laws, people are like, uh, it's their states' right. So you're like, back to the states' rights thing. And then, I'm gonna, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we're going to talk about how Jim Crow is upheld through the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson. But I don't, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. All right. This is a super racist cartoon by Thomas Nast. Um, we are going to be dealing with a lot of these. This is, he, in, he intended it to be, be this way. So on the left, we have an Irishman, and the center, a former Confederate, and on the right, a politician. And they're all, they all have their back, feet on the backs of an African American who looks to be possibly a soldier, so a veteran. And he's gripping on to the flag. He's lost his cap. And there's this that's just out of reach. It's a good guess, but that's not what I'm looking for. Not an hourglass, but it looks like one. It's a ballot box. That's how you voted. You took a marble or a piece of paper, and everybody saw how you voted. There was no pro there was no uh, secret ballot. So this man is reaching for the right to vote and is losing it. So this is a solid cartoon. Um, Uh, they tried to make them look uh, apish. He typically made them look very apish, like they were barbaric. Had like usually a bottle of whiskey in hand. That was how they were depicted during that era. Well, the country is super like real anti-Irish in this period of time. Yeah. Um, so the ladies are still fighting for the right to vote. So the old guard, suffragettes, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, Elizabeth King Stanton, Lucretia Mott, um, Gary Nation, they, they take the crusade on. Um, and this moves into like new leaders like Mother Jones, who was a labor rights leader, uh, a woman that you probably don't think of as a big labor rights leader during this era, but she really was. And she was also a uh, voting rights leader, and that's Helen Keller. Um, also, uh, Carrie, Carrie uh, Cat, um, Francis Willard, who led the Temperance League. Again, just sort of a whole new new wave of women, sort of take 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 the torch, 
Um, Susan B. Anthony, before her death, will be arrested for voting for um, for Ulysses S. Grant. Her and Elizabeth Cady Stanton championed the right to vote after the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendment, saying, is it not the women's time? This leads to Susan B. Anthony establishing the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And triumphantly, women will gain the right to vote, but not until after World War I, with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Tragically, none of these women ever had the opportunity to vote, legally. Here we have Susan B. Anthony on the left. That's a, her trial. Um, it's a book written on the trial of Susan B. Anthony for voting for Grant. And then this kind of takes us to really what is the heritage of Reconstruction? It's one that's complex, and it's one that's not, it's like when, when we would just say, oh, what's Reconstruction? Oh, that's the country coming back together and rebuilding the South. It's more than that. Okay? Can y'all hang in there with me for like one more minute? Thanks. So Southerners sort of regard Reconstruction as worse than the war itself because they had lost their... Identity. They had lost their war. They had lost their society. They had lost their economic way of life. They had lost the slave system. They had lost everything politically. It all had been ripped away. So it upended the social and racial system. The Republicans, with good intent, didn't always follow through and just seemed like long standing Yankee invaders and carpet bags. So whether they be there to teach for the Freedmen's Bureau or help rebuild Atlanta or write a new state constitution in Virginia, they were, they were not welcome. And this is going to be one of the most difficult legacies of Reconstruction because when it's all said and done, the group that really seems to be abandoned here are African Americans people that had rights, dignity, and a future for a decade all to be lost for literally just under 100 years. And we're talking not until the Civil Rights Act of 64, 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Civil Rights Act of 1968 is there true equality. And then furthermore, your grandparents, my parents, that's the group, first group of people that are truly integrated. It's really us, you and me, that have been the first real, true, integrated society, part of society, right? And it's kind of crazy to think that that integration, it should have all begun long before the 19... 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, right? And that, that's why it's so important to teach this and to deal with this as difficult as it may be. So the New South attempts to industrialize. They remain a region of farming and agriculture, but the ideology becomes a bit backward and a little, a little troubling because the exact group of people that are destitute should have been colorblind. It was poor African Americans and poor whites who came out of the Civil War with nothing. Very little education, very little opportunity, but endless possibilities. But that's not what happened. And, it, and it's, we're talking not a generation, we're talking four or five generations of this this old status quo, this old lost cause, just hanging on, right? And now we're, we're starting to get past that. And the only way that we get past that is to understand history and realize like what we're doing here, as I said this last class, a better understanding of this, as difficult as it may be, as ugly as it may be, will make us better citizens going out into the real world. So, some people would say the beginning of the lost cause, uh, 
started during the war. Others would say the beginning of the Lost Cause started with the unveiling of Lee's statue on Monument Avenue. That's for you to decide. I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think you could look at the beginning of the end, the unraveling of it all. You could go back to the end of Pickett's Charge in Gettysburg or the fall of Vicksburg on the Mississippi or the surrendered Appomattox or the fact that, you know, Reconstruction didn't really work out or the fact that Jim Crow became the new status quo or the fact that there was an, a lost cause ideology that people clung on to. So, you guys have any questions, comments? All right, cool. 